far out over the Atlantic, a flying observatory. On board, another day of familiar drills and routine procedures. Even at the frontiers of science, understanding comes rarely in a flash of intuition. More often it emerges gradually from a mass of patiently gathered data. Sampling, for instance, the mix of gases in the atmosphere at different times and seasons, different altitudes. Or monitoring the flux of life in the oceans, the movement of its hidden currents in relation to the changing temperature of its surface waters. Research of this kind is being stepped up worldwide. The need to understand the interplay of atmosphere and oceans has been given a new sense of urgency by the realization that our energy consuming way of life may be causing climatic changes with adverse consequences for us all. surface temperature drops to minus 150 degrees Celsius. In sunlight it rises to over a hundred. Virtually the same distance from the Sun, temperatures on Earth are much less extreme and we owe this life-giving fact to its atmosphere, in particular to the presence of the so-called greenhouse gases. Energy from the sun reaches us in the middle bands of the electromagnetic spectrum as light and heat. To balance this daily income from the sun, Earth radiates energy back, but only in the longer wavelengths of the infrared. But it doesn't all escape back into space. Some of it is absorbed in the lower atmosphere, mainly by water vapor, but also by carbon dioxide. Throughout the long period of man's rise to civilization, this blanket of heat absorbing gases has kept the average global temperature around 15 degrees Celsius against the moon's minus 20. But in the last 150 years, this balance has been altered. Burn any organic matter and its content of carbon combines with oxygen. Burning a cubic meter of natural gas produces roughly two kilograms of carbon dioxide. A liter of gasoline, two and a half kilos. Burn a ton of coal and you release up to four tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Since 1850, the consumption of these fossil fuels has increased a hundredfold. Add to this the more recent burning of the tropical forests, and the result has been a marked and accelerating increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What's more, there's been an even sharper increase in other, even more potent greenhouse gases, which absorb energy at different wavelengths, retaining even more heat in the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide and ozone, mainly from traffic. Methane from cattle and rice fields. And new to nature, the CFCs, used as blowing and cleaning agents and refrigerants. These other gases could soon be absorbing as much radiation as carbon dioxide. But has this started to make the Earth warmer? Weather is hard to predict, but records of its past behavior go back a long way. 
fertile ground for the revealing eye of the computer. This warming gradually spread to the rest of the Arctic by the 1930s and into the 1940s. And by 1941, the warming has spread across the Arctic and extensively covered most of North America. Region by region analysis of world temperature records shows a small but significant warming trend over the century with a marked increase in the 1980s. It's beginning to spread down to the tropics as well. Yes, it's not just over land areas, it's over ocean areas in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Reduced to global averages, it shows a rise of just half a degree Celsius. This could be due to some natural climatic change but it does accord with computer models based on the known atmospheric processes and predicted build-up of the greenhouse gases. These models contain many uncertainties, but they forecast that by 2050, global mean temperature could have increased by at least a degree and a half, possibly near a four. Snow melt there. This may not sound much, but what the computer modelers are looking at is the possibility of change at a rate faster than at any time since the end of the Ice Age. I think particularly over the ocean here, over the North Pacific... Change too fast, perhaps, for life to adapt without severe dislocation. What they foresee is not a steady and even warming overall, but alterations to the familiar patterns of climate and the increasing frequency of abnormal weather. No two scenarios fully agree. But their strange, mesmerizing images of possible futures have each prompted the same serious warning. A warning endorsed by a uniquely broad consensus of scientists in their report to the United Nations at the end of 1990. By that time, Early predictions that rapid melting of the polar ice caps would inundate coastlines and drown major ports and cities had given way to a less apocalyptic vision. Instead, a slow rise of a meter or so over the coming century. But even this could be disastrous. Tropical islands, barely afloat even now. First made uninhabitable, and then obliterated beneath the waves. Wetland habitats destroyed by intruding salt. Coastal lowlands everywhere suffering pollution of precious groundwater, on which so much farming and so many cities depend. And the sea doesn't always destroy by stealth. The coincidence of high tides and severe storms that broached the defences of Holland in 1953 was a freak event. But it's thought that warmer seas could make such destructive surges more frequent and even more ferocious. Today, Holland lies safe behind its elaborate and expensive defences. Elsewhere, in a poorer world, land and people remain at risk. Bangladesh is no stranger to disaster. A sixth of its land is barely above sea level. Land on which 20 million people depend for life and livelihood. If the weather machine were to be wound up to such new levels of energy, no country would remain unaffected. A high priority for the climate change modeler's attention has been the future distribution of rainfall and the impact of global warming on agriculture. Today, with only two months' reserves, 
five billion people depend on just a few strains of staple grains, each grown within restricted climatic limits at the mercy of the weather. And tomorrow, with its prospect of billions more mouths to feed, what is now considered abnormal weather could become a new norm. We have seen the consequences in our own time, but mostly at farming's outer margins. Next century, this could perhaps be its heartland. In a crowded world, subject to such adverse shifts of climate, who would take care of such greenhouse refugees? Faced with such a disturbing scenario, governments are having to consider their response. Global warming is not yet certain, but many think that to wait for final proof would be irresponsible. Action now is seen as the only safe insurance. But what should that action be? Down there, in the real world of the here and now, a billion people are intent on maintaining their high standard of living. Four billion more trying hard to catch up with them. Till now, the dynamic of rising material standards has been coupled to an ever-increasing consumption of carbon-based energy. broken. Can emissions of the greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, be cut back fast enough to provide that essential insurance without blunting the forward thrust of development? In a world of nation states, could such a global target be agreed, let alone achieved? Flying high over the poles, scientists regularly monitor the strength of the Earth's protective layer of ozone. The discovery that man-made gases used in industry were destroying this vital shield brought an unusually swift political response. But the international agreement to phase out the use of these CFC gases was signed in the knowledge that safer substitutes could be developed. To reduce emissions of carbon dioxide is a far greater challenge. Even if a common target could be agreed, each nation would have to decide how best to meet it, which of the available options to choose. Advocates of nuclear power see the chance to revive its flagging fortunes, a clean form of power to replace fossil fuels. They point to new designs of reactor, considered inherently safe, and so cheaper to build and simpler to operate. But public anxiety about reactor safety and concern over the disposal of radioactive waste suggest it's unlikely that nuclear power could be expanded fast enough to make a real impact on carbon emissions. Water and natural steam have been generating electricity for close on a century. But there is limited scope for further large-scale projects. For years, the harnessing of various forms of energy derived from the sun has been written off as uneconomic or of limited application and value. 
But new technologies and courageous investment have brought a change of perception. In California, solar heat has been successfully harnessed to provide electricity on a commercial scale. So has the power of wind. Two potential sources of clean power already, and others may soon follow. Widely applied, they might help reduce the adverse impact of growing energy demand. But they could not alone do enough to slow global warming as fast as the scientists advocate. An ultimate answer remains way beyond our reach. The dream of clean, cheap power from nuclear fusion. Technology apart, the costs of slowing global warming are potentially enormous. That's why the most favoured option, and the one thought most cost-effective, is a drive for greater efficiency in the way existing forms of energy are produced and used. From the air, the principal target can be made clearly visible. Waste heat revealed as reds and yellows by infrared photography. Over half the energy we consume is never put to useful work. Look, for instance, at what happens with electricity. A major source of man-made carbon emissions are the world's coal-fired power stations. Of the coal's available energy, only 35% is transformed into electricity. Further losses occur as the power is distributed and used. An incandescent light bulb converts only 5% to light. 95% is lost as waste heat. Less energy wasted would mean less energy needed, less carbon dioxide and the added benefit of saving precious resources of fuel. Simply changing from coal to gas could cut carbon emissions by roughly 40%. And using the latest combined cycle turbine technology can raise the efficiency of power generation even further. But for many countries, gas is not an available option. Coal itself can be gasified and used much more cleanly and economically. Fluidized bed combustion is another of the new technologies that can achieve efficiencies well above conventional levels. Whatever fuel they use, power stations cannot avoid producing surplus heat, but it need not go to waste. Denmark is one of the countries that has pioneered its use for district heating. Metropolitan Copenhagen's ambitious new scheme has effectively doubled the overall energy efficiency of its power stations and so halved the volume of carbon dioxide that would otherwise have been produced. The principle of combined heat and power can be applied in a variety of ways. It can even provide steam and hot water for an individual building or factory process. It can be applied just as effectively to established installations as to new purpose-built ones. Within the time frame set for the stabilization of carbon dioxide emissions, many existing installations will come due for renewal, a chance to upgrade performance by up to 50%. Whatever combination of energy services is needed for a particular building or industrial process, 
A key to optimal efficiency is the revolution in control technology brought about by electronics and the microchip. High levels of energy efficiency that can now be reached in large-scale installations can also be achieved on the much smaller scale of private housing. These low-energy houses were built to show what can be achieved. They look perfectly conventional, an important point in their favour. Whether for heating or air conditioning, the same equipment and controls can equally well be used to upgrade older houses, older blocks of flats. To combat global warming does not mean scrapping an entire way of life, but it does mean changing public perceptions and attitudes to its extravagances. If everyone switched to the new low energy lights, cities the size of New York, Moscow or Bombay could each cut over a million tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year. Nearly half the world's oil is used by its 500 million road vehicles. 400 million of them are private cars. And every year, each of them produces on average four times its own weight in carbon dioxide. Vehicles of all kinds have constantly improved in performance and reliability. But the internal combustion engine has remained only some 20% energy efficient. What might the future bring? Inventive genius has already taken the solar cell across Australia at 70 miles an hour. But this is unlikely to be the way forward. Today, the average car may still travel less than 10 kilometers on a litre of gasoline but it could go three times as far. The prototypes, petrol and diesel, already exist. What are the chances of even a majority of cars performing to such a standard in 15 or even 20 years' time? Behind the question lies the crux of the whole issue. combat the threat of global warming will take more than a set of technological fixes. What would induce consumers to insist on and pay for the speed of change necessary to make an impact on the problem? What carrots, what sticks might governments employ to stimulate their economies in the right direction? Advocates of intervention can point to certain precedents. In a number of countries, the switch to unleaded petrol has been encouraged by tax concessions. Taxation can work both ways. Already there's talk of a carbon tax on the principle of heaviest polluter pays most. But how to achieve fair compliance across national borders? There are encouraging signs here too. The European Community, for instance, has agreed to radical new pollution control standards applicable to all new cars from 1993. But global warming calls for a global response. And the world is not a common market. In Eastern Europe, decades of bureaucratic incompetence and neglect have left a legacy of outworn, outmoded industry and a blighted environment. 
if the threat of global warming is to be realistically addressed, the future will need to be different. Others are coming from even further behind and face even greater problems. Their ambition is not just to follow behind the richer nations, it's to catch up, and they will have to cope with the needs of fast-growing populations too. As they transform themselves into urban, industrialized economies, their share of world energy demand is bound to grow ever more rapidly. What then? How could these countries continue to advance but leapfrog the energy-intensive phase of development by which other nations prospered before its adverse consequences came to light? Their cities stand as impressive symbols of their entry into the modern world. But everywhere, resources for further development are stretched to the limit. The added demands of a rapid improvement in energy efficiencies would be a difficult challenge to meet unless the latest and best technologies could be made available to everyone. Whether or not the threat of global warming proves as grave as the scientists predict, is it too much to hope that it might act as the stimulus the catalyst to a new era of technical and economic cooperation. Our numbers are many and infinitely diverse, but the problems and dilemmas of climatic change concern us all.